This is <clears throat> this is a story called Honor. Um, it all happened when I was in grad school back in the 1980s. I had a professor, Professor Valerie Legorio. Uh, she is dead now, and I have uh, no idea what became of the Muslim. Um, uh, Valerie Legorio was a medievalist, uh, a Christian. Uh, most professors uh, at the university level, at least in, in my experience, are atheists. Uh, but the medievalists uh, often seem to be believers, um, oftentimes uh, Roman Catholics. I have not met a huge number of medievalists, but uh, the ones I have met, it seems like 80% of them at least are, are, are Christians, usually Catholics. Uh, Valerie Ligoria was kind of a character. I, I think everybody who met her would kind of go, well, my goodness, she's quite an individual, a memorable person. Uh, she was always very expensively dressed, or at least it seemed to me, you know, very nice dresses, always dresses, never, never anything like a pantsuit for Valerie Ligoria, always wearing high heels and stockings and, uh, oh, uh, her hair was always piled up on top of her head, kind of like a turban made out of uh, hair. She was getting near retirement, uh, but still very, very formidable, uh, very intelligent. Uh, she, she knew, uh, well, I'll tell you one thing about her. She, she liked to make these sort of theatrical statements, and she would tell you about her past and how she used to be, a, I don't know, a belly dancer or, I don't know, a roller skating champion or a lady wrestler. I, I don't even know if these stories were true. They were always kind of amazing uh, stories. Uh, lumberjack, I, I don't know. and uh, or, or she'd say, um, I am my father's only virgin daughter. You know, sort of look at you and uh, like, like, like you wanted to do anything about that. Uh, I am an unclaimed treasure, that, that, that sort of thing. Um, she knew everything that you can imagine about uh, Arthur, Ar King Arthur and Lancelot and Guinevere and all those Arthurian stories and, uh, and saints, Catholic saints, uh, especially the mystics. Uh, she, she, she just uh, she knew so much about those. I, I sometimes wondered if she was some kind of uh, mystic herself and maybe, maybe at night she saw visions or, or something. Um, uh, she taught us about Chaucer, Canterbury Tales, and medieval poetry. Um, we had to read the poetry out loud in Middle English. Uh, no, no modern translations. It had to be in Middle English. Um, I think I began to love the sound of verse because of Valerie Ligorio. Uh, to this day, I like to read poetry out loud. I do my best to read Chaucer out loud to my students. Um, one thing, though, the medieval... Christians um, hated the Muslims, uh, the Saracens, um, and Valerie Ligorio seemed to take an extreme dislike to one of my fellow graduate students, a, a Muslim student named Ahmed. Uh, Ahmed, uh, the rest of us were dressed in, uh, you know, blue jeans and uh, uh, t-shirts. Um, like we were clinging to our undergraduate years, but uh, Achman already looked like a professional. He was tall and uh, elegant and uh, impeccably attired. And, uh, uh, people uh, told me that um, he was a Palestinian. Uh, I, I had never in my life met any kind of Muslim, and I certainly had never met a Palestinian. I heard a rumor that one time uh, he got a phone call from home and uh, he flew all the way back to the Middle East to the West Bank and when he came back, when he came back to our university, he had a wife uh, and apparently it was an arranged marriage. Um, uh, th this wife, uh, sometimes you would see them downtown and she would be walking behind him, like three, three steps behind him. And that, that was considered outrageous by the feminists uh, that, that I knew. And they, they, they said Ahmed was a sexist, the worst kind of sexist. And all those kind of Muslim men are horrible sexists. And uh, I had a lot of Jewish friends and my Jewish friends told me I should avoid him. You know, Palestinians are trouble, nothing but trouble. Um, well, one day I had lunch with him. And um, I, I think maybe it's a big deal if you have lunch with a Muslim, if you share food with a Muslim from the Middle East. And I felt like that day he became my friend. Um, it had a kind of formality to it. I felt like there was some kind of bond uh, between us that was uh, different in, in quality to a typical casual American uh, friendship. It, it felt like, I don't know, but it was, it was like by sharing food, we were involved in some kind of ritual you know, that, uh, that cemented our, our relationship, our friendship.
he told me the amazing story of his of his life, and it was not it was unlike any story I had ever heard of any anyone who was my friend. Uh, he had started out a shepherd boy. He lived in a little village in Palestine, crowded village, I guess. Uh, and he would, uh, you know, little kid, he would be out there on uh, I don't know desert somewhere with sheep. And uh, he he said when he was I don't know like ten years old, he was looking at the uh, at the sheep, and he realized he could spend his entire life in that village and never become anything but a shepherd. And he took a kind of vow that he would, that there was only one way he could even imagine escaping the poverty of that village. Uh, you went through school, the kids went through school, this Palestinian school. And, and at, at the end of it, when you were, I think when they were 17, they took a test. Everybody, every kid took a test. And, and one kid, the kid who did the best on that test, got a scholarship to a Jordanian university. Jordan is one of the countries right beside uh, Israel. Uh, but that's it, that one one kid. So unless you had the highest score on that test, uh, he, he believed he would he would be the rest of his life. He'd be stuck in that poor, poor village and never become anything but a shepherd. He studied and he studied and he studied. And, and he said when he finally took that test, he said never in his life before or since that he felt that kind of pressure. That test determined the rest of his life. And he took that test and he got the highest possible score, and he got that scholarship to a Jordanian university, and he could start the next phase of his life. Though he, he told me in the Middle East, uh, violence, uh, hatred, they can follow you everywhere. And what had happened, um, I mean, Israelis, uh, you know, God bless them, but they are very cruel to the Palestinians. Uh, you know, in their view, with good reason. But uh, uh, as a result, uh, you know, blockades, bulldozing, dropping bombs on the Palestinians, uh, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, Palestinians fled uh, the West Bank and ended up in Jordan, the country of Jordan, in the southern part of Jordan. And uh, finally, the king of Jordan, these are all Muslims, but you've got the Jordanians and the Palestinians, and they're not exactly the same. And the king of Jordan got sick of it. And he told his army to drive the Palestinians out of Jordan. Um, and that's right when my friend, uh, you know, was attempting to take courses at this university in Jordan. He was living with his sister and her entire family. Uh, she, they had an apartment. They were in an apartment, in an apartment building. And with many other families, maybe 20 families all in the same apartment building. Uh, he, he told me this apartment building was five stories high when the war began, the war between the Jordanian army and the Palestinians. And then all of those families were so terrified, they went down into the basement, just packed. The basement was just packed with uh, Pal Palestinians. And um, he, he said uh, when, when the, the battle there in, the, in, the, in that town ended and they came out from the basement, uh, that five-story five building was a three-story building. Uh, th this kind of stuff thrilled me. I mean, it was uh, it was so completely anything uh, I, I had ever ever experienced. I had heard all my life about the, you know, the Israelis and the Palestinians and their conflict, but I, I had never heard anything about it from an actual person that I knew that was a friend of mine, and certainly not not from a friend who was a Muslim. Ahmed believed in honor. Uh, he told me one time that in a world that is ruled by the corrupt. A man must struggle to hold on to his honor. Um, when he finally graduated uh, he, he, in Jordan, uh, he, he wrote a book. Uh, and uh, it got published only there in, in, uh, in Jordan. And, uh, but it made a little bit of money, and he had enough money, and he flew all the way to the United States. Uh, but as soon as he got to the United States, he got robbed. He was in Chicago, and he got robbed. Uh, he was penniless in Chicago. And... Um, he got a job in a little uh, Muslim grocery store. I think it was illegal uh, Illegal people. Uh, you know, he got paid like a dollar an hour. He lived in an apartment with like 20 people. Um, I, I was just so impressed with him. To, to me, he seemed, I mean, it seemed like all the rest of us were lazy, whiny Americans. And here was this guy with this, um, this amazing story who was now married and had kids. And he was doing his damnedest to get his uh, doctorate and hold on to his honor. Uh, he ended up in Valerie Ligorio's uh, Chaucer class. Now, Valerie Ligorio, at that point in her career, was a very temperamental person. <clears throat> People told me that she was actually an alcoholic and that she would go home every night and get polluted and that you should never, ever take her in the morning. But I was already signed up for the class uh, before I knew that. People said that in the morning she, was, she had a terrible hangover and a violent temper. Um, 
And all I know is that she yelled. She yelled at us every day. We'd, she, we would have to recite in the Middle English, and we wouldn't do it very well, and she'd yell at us. Uh, uh, I mean, one time I saw her, there was some noise on the other side of the room. There was like another classroom on the other side of the wall, on the other side of the blackboard, and she ran over to the blackboard and started pounding on it with her fist. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up in there! Uh, I mean, volatile. Uh, I would say she was definitely a volatile kind of woman, and she especially seemed to... Uh, uh, object to Achmed. And as far as I could tell, he was the best student in our entire class. And when, when he would recite uh, poetry, he, sometimes he wouldn't even read it. He would just recite it from memory. Uh, and, and it seemed to me he did it perfectly. He did the Middle English show perfectly. I'll give you a sample. Uh, this is just the very beginning of uh, Chaucer. And I think to this day, if Valerie LaGuardia was here, she'd be yelling at me because I probably don't do it perfectly. But I'll give you a kind of a sense of what you had to say. Uh, this is just the first 12 lines of Canterbury Tales. Wan that April with his sure suta, the drut of March a passed to the ruta, and bath in every vein and sweet liqueur, of which vacho engendered is the fleur. When Zaphirus eke with his sweet breath, inspired a thought in every holton heath, tender a carpus, and the young son hath in the rom his half a corsiron, and small a fowler's mock and melody. That sleep at all the nicht with open ye, so pricketh him natura in her courages, dawn and long and folk to go a pilgrimages. And for the for the final, we'd have to stand up uh, and and re recite that perfectly, perfectly. And and so far as I could tell, when Achman did it, he he did it perfectly. But she blew up as soon as he was done. And she said that according to her, he butchered every single line. He was a complete failure, an embarrassment, and he should shut up and sit down. Sit down, Ahmed. And, and the way she said it was so contemptible. And the look on his face, I remember to this day, this sort of look of cold uh, contempt. And he refused to sit down and he just walked out of the room. Uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, in my humble opinion, he was the best student in the class, and she gave him a B. He formally protested. Uh, he challenged uh, the grade. He accused her of bigotry. Um, he asked me, would I testify? Would I, would I uh, back him up that she indeed was prejudiced against him? I, I was afraid to get involved. Um, she insulted everyone. She insulted all of us, uh, not, not just him. Um, it, was, it seemed very subjective. Was it really worse with him than others? Was she really motivated by bigotry? Maybe she was just hung over. Um, finally, I told him I wouldn't do it. I needed to graduate. I needed to complete my doctorate. I didn't want to make an enemy out of one of the full professors. Um, there were hearings. Uh, and, of course, uh, the whole thing got dropped. Uh, st students never win these battles. Honor. I am still thinking about it. Here in the USA, do we have honor? Do I have honor? Um, in order, in order to finish uh, his uh, studies, he had to take money from Palestine, uh, uh, but it, but he also had to agree that he would return to uh, Palestine and become a professor in Palestine. So uh, when he finally got his degree, he took his entire family. He had a wife and a couple of kids, and he took them back to the West Bank. Um, you know, to the endless feuds, to the wars and civil wars that all continues to this day. He told me that in the West Bank, people had to be terribly careful. Uh, you utter an opinion, a political opinion, and it's possible someone will murder you for that opinion a week later. I never saw him again. Valerie retired a few years later. I heard she moved to California and moved into a retirement home. Uh, they said uh, she played the ukulele to entertain uh, her companions and uh, recited poetry perfectly. Uh, she attended Mass every day until she died.